to just a quick summary of what we've started with. They learned by 1950 that they were they had 61,700 articles in their medical archives about calcium. They were beginning to learn how important calcium was in our diets. And they were adding 1,100 every three months. I wanted to talk about how energy is created and how calcium creates that energy by the reserves of calcium in your body because of the anions and the cations. The anions spin one direction, the cations spin the other direction. And when they're spinning, they are creating energy. But if all you have is acid, calcium is one of the only truly anionic items that uh, spins the other direction can create alkalinity to give you energy. If you have used up all of your calcium resources, then you will begin to have trouble maintaining your pHs or your potential of hydrogen. Your pH shows the speed of the ions through your body. When your pH is high or acid, that means the ions are going through your body very fast it means that you're not picking up your nutrition because they don't have the time for that to happen. And you tend toward diarrhea at times. And um, if you are overly alkaline, then it slows everything down. And the problems that are caused when your body wants to throw off cell debris, like cells that are dead, that are constantly being replaced with new cells, the dead cells are thrown off. But if they don't get out fast enough, then they release their salts before they can get out. And these salts are the ones that cause heart attacks and heart trouble. So it's important to have the right speed of the ions through your body, which is what pH is. The right speed of your cells in your body. Your lip, If you're too acid, you're aging too fast. All right, so now we're talking about the fact that they were beginning to understand the importance of this calcium. We know about it in our gardens because when you put calcium in your gardens, it sweetens the soil. And when someone is very low in calcium, they can become very crabby. Women need seven times as much calcium as men during their childbearing years, but we still need more calcium than men, even when we're not having children. So back to my book. So because of the vastly increased research, it is now a well-known medical fact that most adults are losing up to 1.5% of their total bone mass a year. This is a loss of mineral reserve energy because it's the source of calcium for your body. When you're not getting enough in your diet, your body will steal it from your bones and your teeth. So something like a savings account so as the body tries to keep its mineral needs supplied from day to day, this loss, if it progresses for a long time, will be seen in symptoms related to thin, porous, brittle bones, loss of physical height. So he has a little note here in a square, and I'm going to read it. In the light of present knowledge, it can be seen that disease starts primarily at the atomic level when the proper release and utilization of energy are interfered with and proper control of biological activities is disturbed by malpositioned molecules. So, okay, back to the book. I just didn't want to miss that for you. Okay, so loss of physical height is another sign that you're, you're um, losing your minerals, calcium minerals. So along with aging, and it results in changes in the electromagnetic pattern and structure of the body. This affects the body's ability to resist disease. In fact, some data indicates that women after menopause are losing upwards of 15% a year of bone mass, and 80% of that loss is calcium. So as a dental physician who has been intimately involved with clinical nutrition for three decades, it has been gratifying to see how people are becoming more informed about the importance of nutrition for physical well-being. However, on the other hand, I have been very concerned with the misinformation and lack of helpful knowledge that's available to the individual about calcium. The most important mineral for the physical body, no other mineral has received more notoriety in recent years than calcium yet. 
remains so misunderstood by human by humans whose physical bodies absolutely require it. If you don't believe me, walk into any health food store or pharmacy for that matter and see how many different kinds of calciums there are available for sale. Then just ask someone who is supposed to know what they're selling, including the pharmacist, what the best type of calcium is for your own individual needs. And you're guaranteed to get as many different answers as there are types of calcium supplements. So this kit in this book is for the sole purpose of providing you with a simple yet comprehensive way of understanding your individual calcium needs, as well as other associated mineral needs. For the first time anywhere, you will be able to access knowledge through a very simple do-it-yourself test based on over three decades of clinical experience to tell you how much and what kind of calcium your own body individually of your chemistry really needs. So why is calcium important? Of all the minerals in the body, calcium is the most important. It is used by weight and volume in the human body more than any other mineral. Calcium is also the key mineral that primarily influences the ratio of all other minerals in the cell structure. In other words, calcium determines how other minerals are proportioned in the cell and tissue structure of the body. Evidence indicates that when the level of calcium changes in a tissue, so do all the other mineral levels change through a chain reaction. Um, to put it in a nutshell, here are a few of the important reasons why calcium is vital. Number one, calcium determines the ratio or proportion of all other minerals in your cell's molecules. It is vastly superior to assisting other mineral into the cell Thus, it has the ability to bind to several different elements at once, enabling it to bind and bunch up long proteins, an ability necessary in regulating the entry of mineral ions into the cell. This allows calcium to bring the most nutrients into the cell. Number two, calcium is responsible for the density, the color, and the function of the cell. In other words, calcium, by its commanding responsibility, of directing other mineral proportions determines the hardness of the cell structure. And when mineral ratios become improper due to calcium changes, the corresponding color of a given tissue changes, along with an alteration in the function of that tissue. Ever wonder why you see such changes in your skin color when you're not feeling good? Number three, calcium as the major mineral in biolog biologic life can bond more efficiently with protein and water at the same time than any other major mineral. Number five, calcium is the most flexible mineral chemically in biologic systems as an electrically charged mineral particle. Calcium can move faster than magnesium and is therefore more mobile in the system. Next, calcium binds to the central atom of biologically important coordination compounds known as ligands 10,000 times faster and 10,000 times stronger than magnesium. Again, next, calcium requires the least of the ionization electrical charging process while moving through the body. That is, it produces more with less since ionization is necessary to produce voltage for calcium to enter through cell membranes. Calcium is the winner. Next, calcium is the most efficient pH buffer, acid-base regulator. So it regulates your acid and base to make you more alkaline or extracellular fluid. This is crucial in allowing glucose, which is a certain simple sugar, to properly interact with the four nucleotides. The four nucleotides are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, the basic building blocks of DNA. Calcium next is overall the best tranquilizer that nature ever supplied. Calcium releases the mineral energy of your food during digestion. The less calcium on your food, the less overall mineral energy that you can get out of your food. Do you ever wonder why after some meals you craved sweets so much? Low calcium foods means low mineral sugars in the food. Therefore, poor energy release during digestion when you don't get enough energy out of your meal, sweet desserts become more appealing. So 
consider this. Calcium helps keep the weight off. Research suggests that if you don't get enough calcium in your diet, you're likely to be overweight. The reason has to do with your body's response to a calcium deficit. When you're low in calcium, your body thinks you're starving and enters emergency mode, releasing parathyroid hormone. This hormone stimulates your bones to release some calcium into your bloodstream. In addition, your kidneys deliver a dose of hormone called calcitriol, a form of vitamin D. I don't think I pronounced that right. Calcitriol. So to increase your ability to absorb calcium, the trouble is that parathyroid hormone and calcitriol stimulate the production of fat and inhibit its breakdown. So as a result, your body stores fat and holds on to it stubbornly, even if you're on a low calorie diet. On the other hand, a high calcium intake suppresses these hormones, so your body stores less fat and breaks it down easily. This is according to Michael B. Zemo, PhD, head of the Department of Nutrition at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. So now what do these experts continue to say? Of course, I would not expect you to take my word for it. So here's a sampling of what the experts are saying about the importance of calcium to human health. From the very moment of conception, calcium plays a pivotal role in fetal development. It rushes in as a wave around the egg to herald the sperm's arrival, binding to proteins that help kick off the whole development process. From this first influx, calcium continues to play a critical role and how the body's cells respond to outside signals. It tells muscles to contract, and it tells nerves to release neurotransmitters, at least part of the signal, to help people form and retain memory. It comes full circle with its involvement in cell death. Low calcium intake linked to risk of ischemic stroke. A large number of recent studies have identified the relationship between childhood calcium intake and bone mineralization and the potential relationship to fractures in adolescence, the development of osteoporosis in adults. So uh, I wanna give you an idea of how long all of this informational part is going to go on before we start talking about more interesting things. <laughs> I think just a couple more pages of this, and it may be getting very tedious for you. So just to no, let you know. No, 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 it's very interesting. I'm putting down several points there, which we can talk about afterwards. <laughs> okay. So um, patients with idiopathic hypercalcuria, which is excess calcium in the urine, and calcium oxalate stones are less likely to develop another stone if they adhere to a normal calcium diet that's low in animal protein and salt. Now we've heard about people saying, if you take calcium, you're gonna get stones, you'll get you know hardening of your arteries. And this is what he's saying, that if you, you're eating, if it's low in animal protein in your diet, then that probably won't happen. So, um, so low animal protein and salt when compared to patients who consume a traditional low calcium regimen. Uh, calcium has been recognized as a major regulatory ion in all living organisms. So considering the wide variety of calcium binding proteins in the cell, the potential targets of calcium related disorders are enormous. General interest in calcium binding protein is still in the logarithmic phase with daily discoveries of these proteins. Please note, this next quote comes from a book that's a compilation, which represents some of the best scientific publications of academically recognized scientists in 1985. So this is an older book. This book deserves particular note because world-class scientists were then and are now almost 20 years later still concluding there is a link between calcium deficiency and cancer. So calcium most certainly be the major bioelement of the times, only a generation ago, the calcium ion was known to physiologists and biochemists as a component of bone mineral as a blood plasma constituent required in heart function and blood coagulation, but little more. But in the 70s, a crescendo of calcium ion research developed. And today, we know dozens, if not hundreds of different cellular and extracellular processes that are regulated by the changes and cytosolic or extracellular cal calcium ions 
Indeed, the calcium ion is emerging as a most important and ubiquitous intracellular messenger. So that was an excerpt from uh, the professor of medical science, John Hopkins University. Calcium is central to the ordered progress. Oh, here's a note. Calcium in the Atkins diet. You remember the Atkins diet. With so much attention being given to the Atkins diet, very few are aware of the negative effect that the high protein diets have on calcium balance. Yes, high protein diets cause calcium dumping in the urine and are a major contributor to calcium kidney stone development. So I didn't want to miss that. But as we, as we have seen, though, calcium is central to the ordered progression of replicating cells through their growth division cycle. Neoplastic epithelia and mesenchymal derived cells can initiate DNA synthesis and proliferate normally in a low calcium medium, which does not support the, prolifer the proliferation of their normal counterparts. Hmm. Did you know that optimal levels of calcium in your body chemistry will keep all types of excess and waste salts in your body from being hazardous? And besides needing calcium ions, normal cells must adequ adequately spread out. I'm going to have to tell her I'm on the phone. I'm sorry. Excuse me one moment. I have a conference call I'm on right now. Okay. Okay. I'll check with you later, honey. Thank you. Oh, sorry. It was my neighbor. Calcium is specifically required for spreading. Okay, hold on a second. Besides needing calcium ions, normal cells must adequately spread out on a solid substrate before they're able to initiate DNA synthesis, and calcium is specifically required for that. Lowering the extracellular calcium and preventing spreading both block the initiation of DNA synthesis without stopping ongoing DNA synthesis. The elimination of extracellular calcium requirement for proliferation of viruses can be mimicked by exposing proliferatively inactive calcium-deprived normal cells to calcium-independent nucleotides, protein kinases located in the plasma membrane. Thus, addition of such subunits to the medium of normal cells cause them to behave like neoplastic cells by initiating DNA synthesis in calcium deficient medium. It's clear that the proliferative calcium independence in vitro is a universal property of neoplastic cells, the understanding of which may be the key to understanding cancer. So that paragraph might be one that has to be really looked over more carefully if, um, to understand what they mean by that. That's the key. Okay, the proliferation of, of different cells, like in cancer, when the cells of cancer cells proliferate without with a, without having calcium, um, that they'll probably proliferate. But if you have enough calcium, maybe they won't. A number of important metabolic processes are influenced by small changes in extracellular ionized calcium concentrates. That includes the excitability of nerve function, neural transmission, secretion by cells of proteins and hormones, and other mediators such as neurotransmitters, the coupling of cell excitation with cell response. For example, contraction in the case of muscle cells and secretion in the case of secretory cells, cell proliferation, blood coagulation. The um, by acting as a cofactor for essential enzymes involved in clotting, the maintenance of the stability and permeability of cell members, modulation of enzyme activity, in particular, those enzymes involved in glycogenolysis, the splitting up of glycogen, the chief carbohydrate storage material in man, Gluco, uh, gluconeogenesis, the formation of carbohydrates from proteins and fats, and gluconeogenesis is like a new formation of, of sugars of carbohydrates for proteins and fats. Protein kinases, enzymes that catalyze energy transfer from ATP to protein, are calcium dependent, the mineralization of newly formed bone. So that was taken also from uh, the University of Texas. All right, so now he's gonna talk about the ideal calcium source. And I don't know how far you want me to read and how much we wanna cover today. 
So he's just talking about here. The now he's going to talk about the ideal calcium source. But you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's that easy to get the right pH, you know, pH paper on the saliva. Mm -hmm. You don't think it's right? It's not that easy to, to really see. Oh, no. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know, uh, one of these days I'm going to invest in a pH meter. It's a little tiny handheld thing that, you know, we get from Pike Agri, Agri Labs. And uh, then you can put a little drop of saliva on it and it'll tell you exactly what your pH is. But I don't have the extra money right now. So I have a pH uh, measurement for the urine, but, you know, mm -hmm. I have to dip it in the urine. So there is easy, but it's not that mm -hmm. easy with the same uh -huh. pH measurement for the saliva. Then you have to really get yeah. much saliva. Just, yeah, right. I just... Well, and you want to look at it right away. So I just spit on mine. I just put it up here, get it wet and spit on it. And that's usually enough for me. But you could put it in a spoon. You could, you know. Okay. You know, I put it, put it in a spoon and test it. But. So have you talked to other people who have had cancer, who has recovered? I mean, people who have been... Uh, the doctor says there is no hope for you. And have you seen oh. it has turned mm -hmm. around for you though? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. I yeah. And um not only that, I at the same time that I had the cancer, I also was using radionically ionized tinctures. And um so I'm not sure what I can give the credit, you know, for getting over the cancer. The radionically ionized tinctures, and I don't know if you have any faith in radionics or not, but that was what I used too at the same time. But I think our body wants to be well, and if it has what it needs, it will get well. So you're saying don't take any other supplements? Right. Because they interfere with stuff, rather we don't need them. We take stuff because we don't know if we need it, but we think it'll be good for us. You know, and uh, if you know it'll be good for you, like, for instance, if you know you need something, then, of course, you would take it. But but this is all you would need in order to accomplish what he what you would need to accomplish. It's all you need is what's on this chart. But don't you think we need the minerals now when the food is so depleted in minerals? Well, um, that's what the diet comes in. And that's where he talks about the ideal calcium source. He talks about our diet. Our diet is everything. And uh, yeah, our food is, isn't very well mineralized, is it? And um, you, um, I don't know how to answer that. I think that's a decision that you would have to make on your own. You know, like if you have a good source of minerals, minerals are very acid forming and uh, and you don't need a whole lot of them. You just need a little bit. What did he, he said that if you could eat one of every kind of vegetable every six months and one of every kind of fruit every six months, you would have what you needed. You see, one of the in Norway is that we don't get that many different fruits, for instance, or uh, vegetables. Yeah. Oh. Or, or organic. Yeah. Boy, that's tough over there, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So I can see that you would need to do something like that um have a good mineral supplement i think you would have to really research and find a good supplement that was a good balanced mineral supplement that was not that was just minerals and didn't have vitamins in it the vitamins are enzymes and we should eat those between meals and our minerals should be with our meals so that they don't interact with each other okay so minerals with meals and yeah. vitamins in other words in fruits uh Fruit are low yeah. in minerals, right? Yeah, that's true. So, oh, well, don't worry about the minerals that are in your food. Uh, like uh, like if, you're, if it's a fruit meal and it's got minerals in it, don't worry about it. But uh, if you take, if you're taking a vitamin supplement, just take it between meals. Um, but he's saying here, the, major, the primary and major source of our calcium should come from our food. 
However, if the food you are consuming is lacking calcium, your body will be lacking. And due to the poor farming practices that have existed since the chemical revolution, our foods are woefully lacking in calcium, along with many other mineral elements. So he he said that in a four-year study, they sampled over 400 plants from farms across the Midwest and America, and they found that the mineral levels in the plants have dropped from between 8% to 68%. And this was a long time ago when this book was published. So because of these mineral deficiencies in our food supply, our stomachs are not big enough to eat enough food to get adequate minerals. So that's one of the main reasons it's necessary to use mineral and vitamin supplements. So he's saying, yes, we will have to use mineral vitamin supplements. So if we could obtain foods with the proper minerals, we would not need the mineral supplements. So apparently we have to find a good mineral supplement. Um, I haven't been taking any right now, um, but I think a time may come where I will. But did you say in the beginning that we should use it for maybe a week and then stay off that mineral, take another mineral, so we don't oh. mix all kinds of different things all the time? Oh, that's a good idea. I, I think that, yeah, you could uh, you could take a day off. I just take Sabbath off every week. So I don't take anything on Sabbath. Okay. I give my body a rest one day a week. Even, um, from the even not the calcium? Um, when I need to take calcium, I take it because calcium is, that's the one thing that will help you keep your pH where it should be. If your pH is not where it should be, you're not going to get oxygen to your brain. You're not going to uptake your C, your calcium or your vitamin C and your digestion is going to be interfered with. And, um, it's just really problematic. Your body has a really hard time. I would take my calcium if I needed to you know, check my pH and see if I needed it. But um, I'm so trying how, to get a... How, are you, how are your pH? I mean, how? Um, what is your pH normally? Well, okay, so my saliva pH is normally around 6.6, 6.4, 6.6. .6. And uh, my urine pH, it changes because sometimes I'm dumping acids which i need to and i'm dumping um um cell debris you know or dead cells and stuff which i need to that needs to happen it's a circadian rhythm and so then there are sometimes during the day when i'm more acid but i want to be sure that two hours after my meal twice a day after lunch and after dinner or after breakfast and after lunch rather and I will check and see if I did okay with my meal or if I need to do something. And so some oftentimes I will have to do something because I don't always have enough alkaline food on my plate, you know. Um, and some foods, that's why we want to add, make sure that we add. That's why there was a book, and I don't have it right now, and I'm so sorry that I sold it. It showed what diet you should have based on what your pHs were, and that would help to adjust that for you. And um, I don't have that book anymore. There's one available right now, but it's like eighty dollars, oh. and uh, I just don't have the money for it. So you have to research what you should you have in your diet to make sure that you're including a lot of high potassium and high calciums, you know, and high potassium especially. You know, like um, hominy or um, greens or sweet potatoes um, or coconut water or coconut milk. And um, lima beans are alkaline. And just find out, you know, get yourself a pH. Uh, there is a sheet that shows alkaline foods and acid foods. I have one on my refrigerator. It's uh, not exhaustive, but it shows a good list of foods, and I can copy that and send it to you also. Mm -hmm. But you can see, you can pick foods out of the alkaline uh, range and add them to your diet. Are you using beans? Oh, every day. Yeah, me too. Every day. They are really important. If your protein is too low, your neck will hurt, and you will not be able to uptake your potassium. So we've got to have, you know, the beans, they're important. 
So that potassium uh, supplement, which I showed you, I don't remember the, what I was, what this is called. But uh, can I use, you know, on the box, it says I can take half a teaspoon four times a day in eight ounces of water. Is that too sure. much? Is that too much? Well, um, check your pH and see if it's too much. If okay. it's too much, you'll be too alkaline. Your your urine will be too alkaline if it's too much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we're supposed to have something like 4,700 milligrams of potassium every day. And I don't know anybody that gets that. Right. You know, in our food. But our food is, of course, the best source. The reason because it has cofactors, you know, and it's the best source if you can get it in your food. I'm, I'm looking forward to watermelon season because that has a lot of potassium. <laughs> okay. Right. Mm. Well, do um, you think that's enough for today? Yeah, well, if we, uh, I mean, uh, we are I just, can, uh, we are just absorbing what you are saying. So, <laughs> Silva, okay. do, you have, do you have any questions? Well, I have an interesting little part to read. It's not boring. I think we're getting past the boring part. So I could read a little bit more if you're interested in hearing it. Sure, please. Okay. How long do you want to go? Shall we go for another 15 minutes? Yeah, please. Okay. All righty. The primary and major source of calcium should come from our food. However, if the food you are consuming is lacking calcium, then your body will be lacking. Due to the poor farming practices that have existed since the chemical revolution of World War II, our foods are woefully lacking in calcium, along with many other mineral elements. For example, in a four-year study that sampled over 400 plants from farms across the Midwestern America, it was found that mineral levels in the plants have dropped from between 8% to 68%. And because of these mineral deficiencies in our food supply, our stomachs are not big enough to eat a sufficient volume of food in order to get adequate minerals. So do you ever wonder why there's so much overeating it's the main reason it's necessary to use mineral and vitamin supplements. And um, But you ask, what about organically grown food? Well, unfortunately, purchasing organically grown food does not assure you that you will get sufficient calcium in your diet. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against organic foods. However, what is being addressed by organic growers is the quality of the food they are growing, especially the calcium content. So how or what is not being addressed by organic farmers is the quality of the food, especially the calcium or content. Organic principles of growing are great as far as they have gone. The problem is that they have not gone far enough. In other words, organic growers are growing clean food. It's free of toxic chemicals, but they fall very short when it comes to mineral quality, especially calcium. It's a very serious problem because the most toxic foods are not the ones that are contaminated with herbicides and pesticides. Actually, the most toxic foods are those that are grown on calcium deficient soil and passed off to ignorant public as fresh healthy food. Toxic because these mineral energy deficient foods contribute to the continuance of the degenerative disease process. That's why this author has seen fit to spend his time in both soil mineral chemistry human mineral chemistry to show not only the need for calcium and mineral colloids, but to show how the farmer and the gardener growing foods on soils rich in calcium and other minerals will have a greater effect on health in the world than all of the medical personnel and health institutions put together. So back in 1980, as I was learning both the agricultural and human application of biological ionization principles, a veterinary physician friend told me this story. He recently had met a man, we'll call Henry. He learned how to grow the highest quality mineral sugar alfalfa hay through working with Dr. Reams. The higher the natural sugar content of a natural food, the higher the nutrient quantity and corresponding quality. So Henry's alfalfa was being cut and cubed for the health food industry because it was extremely high nutritional mineral value. It was measured by the sugar content. However, even more interesting than the high quality alfalfa was a display that Henry showed my veterinary friend. It was a display of cattle leg bones that had been cross-sectioned. So one could see the structure of the bones and their marrow chamber inside. 
on one side of the display were cross. Hey, you muted yourself. Um, soil and feed he had purposely grown with biological ionization principles as learned from Dr. Reams. The other side of the display were cross sections of bones from typical slaughterhouse cattle whose meat is a standard normal fare of the American household. What stood out so dramatically was that the bones of Henry's cattle did not look at all like the slaughterhouse cattle bones. The cross section bones of the slaughterhouse cattle looked like but one is shown in anatomy to be a typical bone cross section. It's dry on the outside of the bone uh, from a quarter to a half inch in thickness and has surrounded a large open area that contained the soft marrow. When the animal was alive, the dry hard bone on the outer edge had a very grainy coarse appearance, but Henry's cattle bones looked more like solid ivory. The marrow channel in the center was extremely small and the mineralized bone structure appeared as a very much high density and thickness. It did not have the grainy appearance. It had a dense, slightly glossy, smooth appearance. The conclusion from this story, all of the animals being used for human food are mineral deficient, otherwise osteoporotic. They're calcium and mineral deficient, mineral colloid deficient, because of the poor mineral calcium deficient soil upon which they and their food are grown. And somebody is trying to call me that is a, uh, working with my blind friend. So I guess I had better close and go. Okay. So oh, thank you so much, um, Caroline. So maybe we can, uh, you know, Silva and I, we could talk a little bit afterwards if you have time for that, Silva. And then we can ask you questions for what you have been saying now before you start to read next time. That sounds great. So okay, honey. And we're, it's going to start getting much more interesting now. Yeah, but you know, I, I think it's already interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, you think that I can order those calcium uh, uh, products which I sent you a picture of? I think you can. Yes, those were good. The only one that I think was the calcium chloride, I don't think you need that. Okay. So, I just need two? Well, if you could get the calcium hydroxide the lime water, it would be really good. Well, and um, I, I just had to write it on hydroxide. Yeah, get, if you could get the calcium. Um, let's see. Let me look back at this chart. Um, it was. It is called Cal Two. It doctor in the daily uh, manufacturing website. They call it C A L Two. Um, or lime water. If you can get lime water, that would work the same. Yeah, but lime water kind of just like lemon or? No, lime water is, is from a rock. It's from stone. It's from a uh, lime, you know, limestone. And uh, they they make water out of it that is a really easily absorbed and um, and amazing for helping to alkalinize. Okay. I can send you some information about it. Okay. Thank you. Okay.